today we're going to be covering the epistemological theory of empiricism, and we're going to look at it through three main philosophers, John Locke, Bishop Berkeley, and David Hume. In order to start discussing John Locke, I think it would be best to put him in a little bit of historical context. Um, this is a larger debate between rationalism and empiricism. We've discussed Rene Descartes before. He was a rationalist in the sense that he believed there are innate ideas that humans have, uh, things that we can know without any empirical evidence. John Locke would definitely disagree with this. Uh, he believes in a theory that's come to be known as empiricism. Descartes and other rationalists would say that there are certain truths on which all of mankind agrees, and because of this, those ideas must be innate. John Locke would agree that there are certain truths on which mankind agrees, but he says there are other ways to show how that agreement occurs. He looks at two possible examples of innate knowledge. And you can see here the two statements. The first one is, whatsoever is, is, as well as, it is impossible for the same thing to be and not be. These are statements that a rationalist may consider innate knowledge. They would say, everyone has this. John Locke disagrees right off the bat that everyone knows these two things. He says in his work that children and idiots may have no knowledge of this. So if we look at little children, they may not know that whatsoever is, is, or that it's impossible for the same thing to both be and not be. Locke might tell us to think about little children, right? Do they really have an understanding that it's not possible for the same thing to be and not be? Does it necessarily have to be this way? The textbook hasn't yet covered Occam's razor, but it's going to be an important concept for discussing these three individuals today. Uh, William of Occam was a philosopher who believed that the best theory is the one that can give the simplest explanation while still explaining everything just as well. So the simplest explanation is really important for him. Um, what, the reason it's been called Occam's razor is because he described it as taking a razor and trimming away the fat of any theory that you have. So again, we're looking for something very simple. Locke believed that his theory of empiricism was much simpler than rationalism, right? In rationalism, you have to posit some ideas that come from empiricism, from looking around and observing things, and some ideas that are innately there. So you have two different ways to have knowledge. Locke says, let's get rid of innate ideas. Let's trim away that fat. I can explain everything about knowledge using just empirical ideas. So what are these ideas? Where do they come from? Locke says man is born tabula rasa, which means he is a blank slate, which is really a very interesting concept of the mind and the brain, right? It's something that we can use in educational theory, too. How we look at knowledge depends a lot on how we teach others. So Locke says we're born as a blank slate. We know nothing when we come into the world. So how do we build up ideas? Locke says, to this I answer in one word, from experience. He believes that there are two and only two sources, or fountains of knowledge, as he calls them. The first is sensation. This is the information we get from our senses. When we look around and see things, when we listen and hear things, when we touch things, these are sensations, and we get data from these. The other way that we get information, or ideas, Locke says is from reflection. This is by observing things within ourselves. In a way, it's almost like a sixth sense that we are able to observe things within ourselves. It's an internal sense. So we can feel if we're angry or if we're upset uh, or if we're happy. These aren't things we can look around and see or hear, but we can observe them within, our, with, within ourselves. So for Locke, those are the only two ways we can get knowledge. Sensation, and reflection. He goes on to break down all of our knowledge into simple versus complex ideas. So let's take an example. Think of an ice cube. What do you think of when you picture this in your mind? Well, there are probably some sensory inputs. You're going to notice that an ice cube is hard and that it's cold. So how does this work as far as knowledge? Well, Locke would say this is two different simple ideas. You have a simple idea of hardness, and you have a simple idea of coldness. When you put these together, you have a somewhat more complex idea of ice. He says you can only get these simple ideas through sensation and reflection. 
So I want you to think for a second. Can you come up with any examples of knowledge that is not derived from your senses? Pause this video and seriously spend a minute thinking about it. Is there any knowledge that you know of that humans have that you cannot find a way to have it stem from some type of sensory input, either from the external senses or Locke's internal sense perception that he calls reflection? Did you think of any? Let me give you a couple that have been suggested. Um, two of the ones that the textbook mentions are the concept of God and the concept of infinity. Are we able to build these ideas from very simple, single sensory inputs? How might we come up with the idea of God? Spend a few minutes and see if you can piece together enough simple ideas to build up the complex idea of God. Locke also says that it's impossible to invent a new simple idea. It's only possible to combine and divide other ideas. He says, I would have anyone try to fancy any taste which had never affected his palate or frame the idea of a scent he had never smelled. He challenges you. Can you come up with a new taste that's not based on something that you've ever tasted before? Or let's think of it maybe another way. How would you explain colors to a blind person who has never been able to see before. Is it possible? Can you explain color to someone who hasn't been able to see? How would you do it? See if you can take a minute to devise a strategy. The next thing Locke does is divide the way we get these simple ideas into two different qualities. Those are primary qualities and secondary qualities. Locke believes that the primary qualities exist in the bodies themselves. So these would be qualities like solidity, extension, figure, motion or rest, and number. The secondary quality, he says, the truth is in their power to produce sensations in us. So these would be qualities like bulk, figure, texture, color, sound, and taste. They only produce are sensations, and they have nothing to do with the thing itself. For example, if you think about color, typically that might be something that we think is in a thing itself. But think about it this way. Have you ever gone to Lowe's or Home Depot and been shopping for a new paint color for your room? Have you seen where they have different lighting set up and you hold the paint sample under it, and it looks different under each type of lighting? If that color can change with different lighting, is the color really in the thing itself, or is it somewhere else? Is it something to do with the way we perceive it, the conditions in which we're perceiving it? Here's another example. Think of fire. From a certain distance, it produces a sensation of warmth. But if you move closer, too close, it gives you a sensation of pain. So can we say that warmth or pain is really in the fire? Is that a quality of the fire, or is it a quality perhaps of ourselves? Some questions to think about as we leave John Locke and get ready to move on to Bishop Barclay. Ideas represent things that are out there. The problem is we can only ever know our own ideas. So how can we tell if those ideas that we have accurately represent what's out there? Are we born with any innate knowledge encoded in our brains? Can the mind perceive things other than physical objects and its own operations? Does all knowledge derive ultimately from either sensation or reflection? And finally, can we be certain that ideas produced by primary qualities resemble the object itself? These are all important questions in determining whether or not Locke was correct. Keeping this in mind, let's get ready to move on to discuss Bishop Barclay. Barclay makes a really interesting argument, and he starts with this mental dependency of ideas. He says, sensory objects, that can be anything, it can be a house, a mountain, a river, these are all things that are present to us in our sense experience. Remember, we talked about that with Locke. You look around, you see a house, you see a mountain, you see a river, you can touch them, feel them. We use our senses to get information about them. Barclay agrees with him up to that point. 
He says, what is presented to us in sense experience consists solely of our ideas or sensations. Okay, still pretty much on path with Locke up to this point. Then he says, ideas exist solely in our minds. The next place he can go from there is to say, therefore, sensible objects exist solely in our minds. And in a weird way, this is applying Occam's razor to Locke now. This is a little complicated to understand, so let's think about it this way. Barclay is saying we can never know anything in and of itself. We can only know something through the idea we have of it in our mind. So if we're thinking about a house, right, we can reach out and touch the wall. We can walk outside and see it. But all we can know are the sensations that these things cause in us. We can know what the touch feels like to us. We can know what the house looks like to us, but we can never actually know the thing itself. So let's think about Occam's razor. We started with rationalism, and Locke said, well, we can trim the fat off of that. We don't need innate knowledge and empiricism, right? We can have just empiricism where our ideas allow us to know things themselves. Well, Berkeley is taking the razor to empiricism now. He says we don't need things themselves and our ideas of them. We can just have our ideas of them. There doesn't actually need to be a thing itself out there like there was for Locke. Things can just be our ideas of them. I don't know. What do you think? Are you buying it? If you're having trouble, let's do another experiment here. Pick up a pencil or a pen or something like that that you have around you. What are you experiencing with this? Color maybe? Visual and tactile sensations of length, maybe the tactile sensation of hardness. Now push the tip of this pencil into your palm. Do it a little bit hard. Don't injure yourself, but maybe feel some pain from it. Ask yourself this question. Where is your pain? Is it in the external world? Something outside of you? Barclay would say no. Pain is an idea, and it's within your experience. All the other properties of the pencil, just like the pain, Barclay would say, have the same status. The hardness, the color, the length, these are just items within your experience. In describing all of the properties of the pencil, you didn't refer to anything external to your own experience. And in fact, you couldn't have, because the only way we have access to anything is through our experience of that thing. This really is not a very intuitive idea at all. It's not what we commonly think of when we think of things around us. We want to think that these things actually exist. Samuel Johnson was a famous English writer, and he attempted a very simple refutation of Barclay. He picked up a rock and kicked it and said, I refute him thus. My question for you, is Samuel Johnson's kicking of this rock really a refutation of Barclay? Why or why not? Barclay has used Occam's razor on Locke himself, who used Occam's razor on rationalism. But there might at this point be a little bit of a problem with Barclay's understanding of the way the world works. It might help to think of it this way. We've talked about epistemology as a theory of knowledge and metaphysics as a theory of what exists out there, right? So Barclay is making an epistemological claim about how we know things. It is through our sense experience. But then he's using that to make a metaphysical claim that there is nothing else out there besides our experience. Where does the problem come in? Can you think of a possible problem with this? The problem is that if everything only existed in the minds of individuals, so in, in my mind or in your mind, what would happen if we weren't observing it? This type of thought leads to a very cliché philosophic argument or thought experiment that you may have heard before. Think of, if a tree falls in the woods and no one is around, does it make a sound? Well, Barclay's system brings up a very similar objection. If we're not around to observe something, does it really exist? As an aside, modern physics is offering some really interesting insight into issues like this. There's a lot of evidence that observation makes a huge difference in the metaphysical status of things. But Barclay, of course, came way before any of that knowledge of modern physics. 
So let's look at how Barclay deals with this potential problem. He looks into the cause of ideas. He says, okay, only the mind can cause ideas. Did our minds produce them? Barclay here says no, because then things would disappear when no one was looking at them. That's the problem we mentioned, right? If our minds are causing everything and we stopped observing them, we'd walk away, they would disappear. All right. So how do we get around that? Bishop Barclay answers, God's mind must have created them. Why? Well, God's mind can keep everything in mind all at once, right? God doesn't leave the room and something disappears. God can keep the entire world, the entire universe, all in his mind, ongoing at once. So in fact, the whole world is just God's mind. We can have direct experience of that world without the intermediate step of physical matter in this case. A famous saying, just like Descartes' cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am, for Barclay is esse est percipi, to be is to be perceived. So one does not exist without being perceived. They're being perceived in the mind of God. This doesn't mean we don't exist. Barclay really thinks we do exist, just not as a substance. Again, this is where his Occam's razor comes in. We don't need substances under Barclay's epistemological and metaphysical theory here. Think about it for a minute. Is there a basic substance that underlies all the qualities that we experience? If so, does it have any inherent qualities? But then what would it be if it has no qualities? Further, it's pretty much impossible to conceive of something with no color or shape, so we cannot conceive of a material substratum, right? We can conceive of things that don't have color or shape, but nothing that's material, only these ideas inside of ourselves. So how could things around us be made up of something which has no qualities itself, but then creates qualities? Even if we try to look to modern physics to answer this, we get ideas like atoms and quarks, uh, but even those have inherent qualities built into these basic underlying building blocks. The basic problem is that it's hard to fathom some underlying substance of all the qualities that we experience. This debate also plays into a lot of modern debates that are still occurring. First of all, this type of thinking was a precursor to Einstein's theory of relativity. It's also still a major point of debate in psychology. The linguist Noam Chomsky says that children's experience with language is too limited. He says they must have some type of innate grammatical structure. But the problem is no one has been able to pull out what these structures are. So basically what he's arguing is that children learn language so quickly there must be some type of innate structure there. Jeffrey Sampson disagrees. He says, I see no more reason to ascribe an innate language propensity to infants than to postulate an innate driving propensity in order to explain why modern British teenagers are keen to learn to drive. There are such obvious social factors which explain the keenness without needing a nativist postulate. So what he's saying, right, is that yes, children do learn language very quickly, but it serves an important social function. They want to learn how to ask for the things they need, for example, just like teenagers want to be able to drive. Cognitive scientist Steven Pinker has done experiments that show infants have ideas such as space, time, and number that are already formed in their minds. He believes that brains become hardwired with these structures through evolutionary history. So maybe humans didn't start with these innate ideas, but as we've evolved, our brains have changed, and those changes have been passed on from generation to generation. So that now, when we're born, our brains innately have these ideas built into them through a structure in the brain themselves. Of course, as I mentioned, this is still an ongoing debate. You have these different competing theories from both sides, but none of them have been definitively proven as of yet. Things get more interesting as we move on to David Hume. When Hume discusses epistemology and our ideas of knowledge, he divides the perceptions of the mind into two categories. The first is impressions. Impressions, he says, are our direct sense experiences. This is inside or out. So it's the things we hear, the things we see, 
the love, the hate, the desire that we feel in us. Ask yourself how this compares to John Locke. What would be impressions for John Locke? So we've said two perceptions of the mind. The first is impression. The second is ideas. For Hume, ideas are copies of our impressions. Ideas are our thoughts or memories of the impressions that we had. For example, I grew up on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, and I had direct impressions of the beach. I could see it. I could hear the water and the tide. Uh, and, and while I was there, I had these direct impressions with sense experience. Later, I moved away to Mississippi State University for my undergraduate work. And there was no beach there, but I had an idea of the beach. That was my memory of seeing and hearing the beach while I was there. Can you see the distinction? Just like Locke, Hume believes that we can combine these impressions to form new things. So think about an example. We have an impression of a horse, and we have an impression of things with horns, maybe a rhinoceros. We can combine these two impressions to create the idea of a unicorn. That doesn't mean a unicorn exists, but you can see how we can build up our different impressions and change them around to create new ideas. Hume's fork of knowledge says that there's two different ways that we can come to knowledge. First is the relation of ideas. For Hume, this would be math, geometry, etc. These things can be discovered by thought, but they're not innate. This is different than Plato. Plato believed these ideas were innate, but sometimes we just had to be led to remember them. Hume doesn't agree. He thinks we can use our reason to discover them, and yet that doesn't make them innate. These things, the relations of ideas, are always true. So think about Pythagorean theorem or other mathematical formulas like that. These would be relations of ideas for Hume. Matters of fact are things where the contrary is always possible. For example, it's cold outside, right? That might be a matter of fact, but the contrary is possible. It could be hot outside right now. That's very different than 1 plus 1 equals 2. That can never not be true. Or, to say it better, it's always true. All of the reasoning within matters of fact seem to be based on the idea of cause and effect, and this is really important for Hume. How do we come to know cause and effect? What does he mean by cause and effect? Well, he means we turn on a light switch and the light comes on. The cause is flipping the switch. The effect is the light coming on. The important question for Hume is how we come to know cause and effect. Some would argue that cause and effect is an innate idea that's built into our minds. Hume disagrees. He believes our entire idea of cause and effect arises entirely from experience. You can't tell, for example, that water would suffocate you just by looking at it. You don't know that something that's thrown up into the air will come back down unless you try it. By seeing these things over and over and over, though, we believe that the cause leads to the effect. Do a little thought experiment. Imagine you're playing pool and one billiard ball is moving toward the other. What could conceivably happen? Don't tell me what experience has shown to happen. Tell me what could conceivably happen. Think about it for just a second. Are you getting creative? There are all kinds of things that could happen. The one ball could go through the other billiard ball. One ball could hit the other and disintegrate into a million pieces. They could both disintegrate. They could hit each other and then suddenly both fly into the air. They could hit each other and disappear, etc., etc. You can keep going with this. There are millions of different things that conceivably could happen. But every time we play pool, we've seen generally that when one ball hits the other, it makes the other one move. This is how we develop this idea of cause and effect. Hume believes that every effect is distinct from the cause. Just because something has always occurred right after another, does not mean that it will always happen that way. The famous example of this is the turkey on Thanksgiving morning. That turkey has been alive for years. Every day that turkey has been alive, it's woken up, 
and it's been fed by this kind, caring man that brings it food. It has every reason to believe that this will continue to happen. It's never witnessed anything different, right? Every single morning that's been alive, this food has appeared. Why would anything be different on Thanksgiving morning? Yet for this particular turkey, Thanksgiving is a very unlucky day. Instead of food appearing, well, this turkey becomes the food for that evening's meal. Based on all the cause and effect that the turkey had witnessed, there was no reason for it to believe that would happen. And that's generally how we think of things in the world. When we turn the handle on our faucet, water always comes out. We think it always will. When we throw something up in the air, it falls back down. We think it always will. But Hume says there's no way that we can know for sure that that will always happen. Just because it has happened every other time we can know in the past is not a guarantee that it will happen next time. Listen how Hume discusses this problem of cause and effect. See if it sounds like anyone else that we've discussed before. What is the nature of all our reasonings concerning matter of fact? The proper answer seems to be that they are founded on the relation of cause and effect. When again it is asked, what is the foundation of all of our reasonings and conclusions concerning that relation, cause and effect, it may be replied in one word, experience. But if we still carry on our sifting humor and ask, what is the foundation of all conclusions from experience, this implies a new question, which may be of more difficult solution and explication. Philosophers that give themselves airs of superior wisdom and sufficiency have a hard task when they encounter persons of inquisitive disposition who push them from every corner to which they retreat and who are sure at last to bring them to some dangerous dilemma. The best expedient to prevent this confusion is to be modest in our pretensions and even to discover the difficulty ourselves before it is objected to us. By this means, we may make a kind of merit of our very ignorance. He's being playful there, and hopefully you're hearing some Socrates ringing there, right? We can make a merit of our very ignorance. What is he saying? He's saying that all of our reasoning and scientific knowledge cannot guarantee that one cause will always lead to the exact same effect. There is no guarantee of that. He says, I have found that such an object has always been attended with such an effect, and I foresee that other objects which are in appearance similar will be attended with similar effects. We make this inference. We believe that one effect will always follow the same cause, but this isn't based on reason, Hume says. It requires that one to know the future will always resemble the, the past, but we can't know that. We connect them simply by habit or custom. So that means for Hume, all of our knowledge comes from habit. Hume says, what then is the conclusion of the whole matter? A simple one though it must be confessed pretty remote from the common theories of philosophy. All belief of matter of fact or real existence is derived merely from some object present to the memory or senses, and a customary conjunction between that and some other object. Or in other words, having found in many instances that any two kinds of objects, flame and heat, snow and cold, have always been conjoined together, if flame or snow be presented anew to the senses, the mind is carried by custom to expect heat or cold and to believe that such a quality does exist and will discover itself upon a nearer approach. This belief is the necessary result of placing the mind in such circumstances. It is an operation of the soul when we are so situated as unavoidable as to feel the passion of love when we receive benefits or hatred when we meet with injuries. All these operations are a species of natural instincts, which no reasoning or process of the thought and understanding is able to either produce or to prevent. Locke believed that we could be certain of knowledge, but for Hume, knowledge really isn't much at all. To be clear, Hume is making only an epistemological argument here. He's saying we can't know anything out there in, of, in and of itself. We can't know that a cause will follow from an effect. That doesn't mean metaphysically that those things aren't there. We simply cannot know whether or not they are, which is very different than Berkeley, of course. Barclay was arguing that those things really were not there. So to review briefly, we've looked at three very different views of epistemology from an empiricist viewpoint. 
Locke believed that things do exist out there, and we can know them through our sense experience. Barclay believed that there are no things out there. They all only exist as ideas in the mind of God, as we do, and we observe these perceptions and ideas. Hume believed we can't know whether or not there are things out there. He was a true skeptic when it came to empiricism. Hopefully, that clarifies the readings from this week. As always, let me know if you have any questions. Mm -hmm.